looking forward to as we move past the face mask restrictions and you know further restrictions of the pandemic is um, getting back to more singing. We've kind of adjusted our schedule because some of you, and rightly so, have noted that it's very hard to breathe with a face mask, let alone sing, and so we don't want anyone passing out in the middle of our worship service, and, uh, and so we've kind of uh, pulled that back a little bit, but I'm looking forward to getting to that point where we can engage in a more full time of ministering to one another uh, through song each Sunday morning. Well, this morning we're back in our study of lament, and as we begin this morning, I want to point your attention to the Bridger Wilderness Area. It's located in the Teton Teton, National Forest in Wyoming, and the park has apparently comment cards that are filled out rather frequently, and the following responses that I'm going to read to you are actual comments that were put down on that comment card and submitted to the park office. Now, here's a beautiful picture uh, of the um, Bridger Wilderness area, or rather part of it, uh, in the Teton National Forest there. Uh, And so, kind of to give you a visual to go with the comment cards here. Uh, Now, the first comment here says this, Trails need to be reconstructed. Please avoid building trails that go uphill. (laughs) It's the Teton National Forest. If you're not going uphill or downhill, you're probably not moving. Another one said, too many bugs, leeches, and spiders, and spider webs. Please spray wilderness to rid areas of these pests. I don't know if they understand the definition of a wilderness area here. Uh, it says, Chairs need to be, uh, chair lifts need to be installed in some places so that we can get to the wonderful views without having to hike them. Another one, coyotes made too much noise last night and kept me awake. Please eradicate these annoying animals. <laughs> Well, this was another one. A small deer came into my camp and stole my jar of pickles. Is there any way to get reimbursed? (laughs) I'm sure the park rangers will contact the deer and get right on that. Uh, The places where trails do not exist are not very well marked, obviously. (laughs) And then finally, the last one is just true. Maybe it was a joke. I don't know. Too many rocks in the mountains. Please remove some. It's the mountains. Well, what these comment cards illustrate is that... People really are not a fan of pain or struggle of any variety. We rebel at the suggestion of it, we recoil at the sight of it, and we reject the suggestion that it might be of any good to us. Yet, pain and difficulty can be some of the most powerful moments of heart and life transformation if we let them be. Over the past four weeks, we have looked at the idea of lament. And what we've been studying these past four weeks is the process of lament. How God has equipped us through His truth to express and handle our sorrow. Now these next four weeks we're going to switch from learning how to lament to learning from our lament. Learning from our grief. Learning from our trials. Now, to do that we're going to go ahead and switch from the book of Psalms to the book of Lamentations. So if you have your Bible this morning, go ahead and turn with me to the very first chapter of the book of Lamentations. If you're looking for it, it's right after the big book of Jeremiah. Small little five chapters there and easy to miss. Now the book of Lamentations is written by the prophet Jeremiah, and it was written in the aftermath of the Babylonian invasion of Judea and the destruction of Jerusalem. Under the reign of King David, under the reign of King Solomon, uh, Israel had uh, prospered as a nation. It's often noted as the golden era uh, of the kings in Jerusalem. But uh, after Solomon, the nation of Israel went through a civil war and split. And you had it split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. Both walked away from God and both were judged by God. And God judged them by allowing other nations to come and conquer them, leading most of their people into captivity. Now, Israel, the northern kingdom, was the first to be brought into captivity by the Assyrians. And for the southern kingdom of Judah, this should have been a wake-up call, right? This should have been the moment in which uh, the people of Judah went, you know what, that is going to happen to us too if we don't repent of our sin and turn back to God. Yet, instead of seeing... The 
clear evidence of what lied ahead of them, uh, they continued on their course. And after a terrible three-year siege, Jerusalem was conquered, the temple was destroyed, and the nation lay in ruins. And so here is Jeremiah looking at a nation torn apart and really left decimated, and he is moved by God to write down these words of lament. Now the theme of the book of Lamentations is wrapped up in its Hebrew title. And its Hebrew title is taken from the very first word of the very first verse, Ekah. It is a Hebrew question, how or in what way? See, Jeremiah wants to have the Israelites look at this nation in ruin, look at their nation in ruin, and learn something. There is a lesson here that the people of Israel need to see, understand, and never, ever forget. Now, like Psalms, Lamentation is a collection of poems. There are five poems, and each poem is an acrostic. Jeremiah uses the Hebrew alphabet, and so each poem is segmented into 22 individual segments. Now, why he's doing this is more than just to be creative. What he's showing the people of Israel is that he is dealing with the whole of their pain, the whole of their suffering, from A all the way to Z. And what we need to understand as we look at the book of Lamentations is that this is not just Israel's story. This is our story that we're reading here. In this book, we're taught how to respond to our suffering and how we, too, need to learn from it. Now, I'm going to try to tackle this morning the first two chapters as one whole. And so to do this, I'm not going to work verse by verse like I normally do through a chapter. Rather, what I'm going to do is kind of parallel each chapter, looking at the major points that are repeated between the two. And so to begin this morning, look with me at the first verse of chapter 1, and then we'll switch over to the first verse of chapter 2. It says in chapter 1, verse 1, How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How, like a widow, has she become? She who was great among the nations. She who was a princess amongst the providences. She became a slave. Now flip over to chapter 2 and look at verse 1 with me. How, and mind you, this isn't uh, kind of just an observation. You know, Jeremiah, through this word, is wanting his people to think about this. How the Lord in his anger has set the daughter of Zion under a cloud. He has cast down from heaven to the earth the splendor of Israel. He has not remembered his footstool in the day of his anger. Well, as we begin this morning, let's start with a word of prayer, shall we? God, as we come before you this morning, Lord, as we've prayed over the past weeks, we want to thank you that you are there to see our grief. We can bring it and express it to you, and you are there to give strength. You are there to guide us to yourself that we might grow in our trust of you. And Father, as we look at the example of Israel, may we see our own story of grief written in it. May we see how we need to learn and process biblically and rightly the truths that pain so often bring into our life. Father, we pray that you would challenge our hearts, transform our lives, that you would equip me as your, your servant this morning to share your word in a manner that glorifies your name and draws people to yourself. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as we begin, I want to draw your attention to that word, how, and define its importance. As we mentioned just a moment ago, Jeremiah is asking this question, how, to draw his readers to think about the source and cause of their suffering. It is important that we learn to lament, but it is equally important that we learn from lament. I like the analogy given by C.S. Lewis as he talks about pain in his writings. He says, God whispers to us in our pleasure. He speaks in our conscience, but he shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. God is present, and God is communicating to us through our pain. Therefore, that means we need to be looking for the lessons and the truths that God would have us see and grasp in the midst of our sorrow. Do any of you have scars this morning? I think everybody went, yes, right? I have several, not very obvious ones, but several. 
Uh, and one that's kind of near and dear to me, you can barely see it anymore. You know, time has caused it to fade away. There's a little bump that I have on the knuckle of my thumb. Uh, I got it when I was 9 or 10 years old, somewhere around there. Uh, we were out in our yard taking care of some brush. There's this big branch that fell down, and I had, you know, a saw, and I was working to cut that branch up. I loved cutting things up. Uh, when I was a little boy, sometimes that got me in trouble. But, because you know, I cut up things I'm not supposed to. But I, I had this branch, and you know branches aren't very stable, and so uh, there were two branches that ran parallel there. And I was cutting the top one off and then going to go to the bottom one. And so to brace it, I grabbed that bottom one, and I had my saw going like this at the top one. Now you guys already see by what I'm physically demonstrating what would happen next. Uh, on the downstroke, I got through the branch, and I kept going right on down into the knuckle of my thumb. And left a left a wound that didn't need stitches, but, you know, even to this day, you know, a number of years later, still has a scar there. Now, that was a painful moment, an unpleasant moment, but do you think I learned something from that mistake? Uh, no. No, thank you very much for your confidence in me. Actually, I did. I did learn something. Uh, and I began to define the way I messed with saws and other tools in the future, because I realized if your hand's underneath it and you're pushing down on it, it's going to go through to whatever's beneath that. Uh, and so a painful moment, but a moment that carried with it an important lesson on safety that I needed to grasp. And by God's grace, our pain carries with it a great potential for growth. For growth. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can look with me real quick at Romans chapter 5. Uh, we read this for our scripture reading, but I'm going to point us back to it again. Specifically, Verse, uh, verse 3 it says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Why would we ever rejoice in our suffering? Because of this, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. As we go through moments of grief, God, by His grace, is using that pain and that sorrow to refine who we are. And therefore, we need to embrace a teachable spirit and a malleable heart. We need to be asking the questions. As I go through this struggle, as I experience this pain, what is it, what is it that it is teaching me about my world, my God, and myself? Now, there are two types of suffering that enter into our life. One is because we live in a broken world that is marred by sin. And I think a great example of that would be Isaiah that hit the East Coast these past two, this past week. You look at the destruction there, the actual loss of life. And people are suffering pain and grief and sorrow because they are living with the weight of existing in a broken world. Other times pain comes into our life because not only do we live in a broken world, but we ourselves are broken people living amongst broken people. Israel's example would be, exa would be a great illustration of that. They had rebelled against God and reaped the consequences of that rebellion. But here's the thing I want us to understand. Either way in which we suffer, there are truths about our world, our God, and ourselves that are being manifested that we need to acknowledge and engage. And so, here's a moment of application, a question I would ask you. Are you willing to let God teach you and guide you through your pain? Are you willing to come into those difficult moments with a humble heart and say, God, help me see through my pain things I would never see through the pleasures of life or the ease of life? Lord, teach me through this sorrow lessons that I could only grasp here and not anywhere else. Well, the next thing that Jeremiah does is he first, he gets the people asking the question, how? You know, begin processing what they're going through. Next, he connects their pain with the person of God. Look with me at verse 5 of chapter 1, then we'll switch on down to chapter 2, verse 2. It says, verse 5, her foes have... Uh, become the head, her enemies prosper. Why? Because the Lord has afflicted her for the multitude of transgressions. Her children have gone astray, captives before the foe. Look with me now at verse 2, chapter 2. 
or excuse me, chapter 2, verse 2. There we go. I've got to get it right. <laughs> the Lord has swallowed up without mercy all the inhabitants of Jacob, and his wrath he has broken down the strongholds of the daughters of Judah. He has brought down to the ground in dishonor the kingdom and its rulers. See, what Jeremiah does here is he puts God center in defining Israel's suffering. So often we want to take God out of the equation when we deal with and define our suffering. And I think we do this out of a desire to protect God. We think God is good and therefore God cannot be responsible for any of these bad things. And to protect the goodness of God, we detach him from the suffering we experience. We free him from any responsibility to it. You know, he's there to save us and comfort us, but he's not at all responsible for the bad things that happen to us. But that's not what Isaiah does, does he, right here? No, he puts God first and center, and he does this because he wants Israel to understand that the suffering they are experiencing is first and foremost about their relationship with God and something that is very wrong with it. Friends, here's something I want you to understand. It is a hard truth to grasp, but one that we must be certain of, and it is this. God is in control of all of our suffering, all of the suffering that goes on in and on throughout the world. Uh, I think of the most simple, s- simplistic uh, statement of God's consuming sovereignty as it's mentioned in the book of Ephesians. Let me turn there real quick this morning, Ephesians 1.11. It says, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things, including our suffering, including COVID-19, including Isaiah's, according to the counsel of his will. God is using suffering, pain, and even grief to further his plan of redemption in our life and in our world. And that does require faith on our part to accept that fact as being true because many times we look at the things that are going on in this world and go, how can this be of any good, any profit, any value? Now, mind you, what we have here, and the reason it requires faith is because we have one singular finite being looking at and trying to grasp the infinite, eternal workings of God. And we just can't do it. It's like looking at two pieces of a Lego set. Legos are big in our house right now, and I love it because now I can play with Legos as an adult and not be judged as immature. Uh, I can say, hey, boys, let's go down. Often, normally it's daddy prompting the boys, hey, let's go downstairs. Our basement's become a Lego room and play with Legos. And so we sit down there and we build Legos together. But it's like looking at two pieces of Legos that go to a set and trying to presume something about the whole of the set. It's impossible to do without seeing the whole picture. And so many times we have to simply say, God, I know you are sovereign and I know you are working all things according to the purposes of your will. And even though I don't understand it, I can trust in who you are and what you've promised to do. Now here's the application. In order to learn from our lament, we must connect our pain with the sovereignty of God. We must make him the first part in our equation as we seek to understand and work through and learn from our grief. Now, uh, as we go on this morning, and I'll leave this up here because I'm running behind on my PowerPoint, uh, there's another, another step in the logic that Jeremiah leads us through here. We have Jeremiah's progression, he, progression here. He says, we have a problem. Why do we have a problem? Well, he goes, God is sovereign and he's ultimately in control over us. What then happened that God would give us over to our enemies? We see the answer in 1 chapter 8 and 2 14. Go ahead and look there with me at verse 8 and verse 14. It says, Jerusalem sinned grievously. Therefore she became filthy. All who honored her, despised her, for they have seen her nakedness, and she groans and turns her face away. 2.14 says, Your prophets have seen for you false and deceptive visions. They have not exposed your iniquity to restore your fortunes, but have seen for your oracles 
a scene for you, oracles that are false and misleading. These verses provide us the answer to Israel's suffering. The people are facing judgment because of their sin. These people, even after repeated warnings from many different prophets, chose to remain rebellious towards God. And Jeremiah, he paints this very graphic picture that depicts for us the realities of Israel's spiritual status. He talks about an unfaithfulness of the people towards their God. It says even the people look at sin and groan because they they realize how bad they've messed up. They realize how big of a mistake they've made. He talks about the failure of the spiritual leaders, their lack of integrity, their unwillingness to call out the sin that was existing amongst the people and lead them back to the true worship of God. See, Lamentations is about more than just a broken city or or a broken nation. What Jeremiah is lamenting over here is the spiritual brokenness of a people. And another lesson we learn from the book of Lamentations is that God is loving, God is merciful, but He is also holy. He is also righteous. And when people rebel against Him, there are consequences. Now, as I said at the beginning, what we see here in Israel's history is a reflection of the story of mankind as a whole. As we look at this book, we should see a number of things that are very familiar. And the first thing that should seem so familiar to us is the rejection of God. Just as Israel turned away from their God, so have each of us. Romans 3.12 says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world, through one man, and death through sin. So death spread to all men, because all have sinned. Romans 3 tells us, just like Israel, each man has rejected God. It started with the first man, Adam, in the book of Genesis, who chose willingly, volitionally, knowingly to disobey the instruction of God. But that rebellion that started there became became innate. Uh, and natural to all those born after Adam. And so we all are born with this natural propensity and a desire to reject God and serve ourselves instead. And Romans 3 explains that there's been consequence to this. Just as Israel reaped captivity for rejecting God, so has humanity reaped consequences for their rejection of God. I like uh, the thought of one pastor, Mark Vergop. He said, all lament and suffering have their roots in the fallen state of this world. Lament interprets all suffering through the lens of the Bible's understanding of the problem of sin in this world. Romans 3 points us back to Genesis 3, where the first man, Adam, willingly rebelled against God, and the consequences of that choice resulted in, in a fractured world. It led to a breakdown in man's relationship with God. It resulted in a breakdown in man's relationship with one another. It resulted in a breakdown in creation itself. And pain and grief are reminders that we are living in a world that needs to be redeemed, that needs to be rescued from sin. Romans 8, 20 says this. It says 22 Uh, on the uh, PowerPoint, but uh, the verse actually is Romans 8.20. It says, For the creation was subject to to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself might be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. You know, a question that is frequently asked uh, these past couple of months is this. Where did COVID-19 come from? Now, what's the common answer that we get when people say, China, right? China. Now, if that's the answer we ultimately give as gospel people, we have fallen tragically short. Friends, we must be pointing people to the source of all death and suffering in this world, because this is not the first plague that has hit the world, and it is not going to be the last one either. 
So we must be pointing people beyond their momentary suffering to the deeper question that needs to be asked, where does sickness and death come from? And we must point them to the Word of God where it explains that it's rooted in man's rejection of God and the consequences that has come from it. If you have your Bibles, flip with me to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes is like Proverbs, but without the upbeatness of Proverbs. It has a much darker but honest look on life. And in verse 2, let's read down through verse 4 this morning. It says, It is better to go into the house of mourning than to go into the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness... Of the face of the heart, it is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of the morning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. Solomon says, it's better to go to a funeral than it is to a party. Wow, that sounds like a really fun guy to be around, right? You want to go to a party? No, I'd rather go walk through the local graveyard. Man, what happened, Solomon? You became a bitter guy in your old age. But why is it better to go to a funeral, Solomon says? Because it awakens us to the reality of our world, the destiny of our life, uh, the the fact that you're all going to die. And what pain does in our life, it awakens our heart to our need of a Redeemer and to be rescued from sin and death. You know, as we've gone throughout this pandemic, the world has had to face the reality of sickness and death in a way that it never has, at least within many of our generations. We've had to face the pain and the loss and the sorrow that comes from it. And for many people, this has been a time of awakening, just as it talks about here in Ecclesiastes. And we as believers should be at the forefront, helping people think through their pain. We should be doing what Jeremiah is doing here with the people of Israel going, let's ask the question, where did this all come from? Why is this happening? We should be driven by a heart of compassion to preach the truth about the world and what's really wrong with it. And let me pause here for a moment just to voice a frustration with the church during COVID. Now, when I say the church, I'm not talking just Walnut Creek Baptist Church. I'm just talking about, uh, what I am talking about is like Christianity as a whole. So don't think like I'm just singling Walnut Creek out here. This is a common universal problem that I've noticed across the board. I think we've spent too much time mocking people's fear. Too much time arguing about face masks and not enough time lamenting the brokenness of our world and preaching the gospel to it. You know, we need to be working with people, and explaining to people, yes, it is hard to live in a broken world ravaged by sickness and death. And you know, if we make it through this pandemic without getting sick and dying, time itself will take your life from you. But, you know, the Bible explains why we have sickness, why we have death, and the Bible gives to us hope for rescue and for healing. These are the words that are to be coming out of our mouth, but instead I've seen Christians posting almost daily on Facebook about how we're overreacting, how face masks are stupid, and how it's all political manipulation, yet nothing has been spoken of sin, death, and a Savior. I believe there's been a lack of compassion on the part of the church, and that lack of compassion has led to a lack of lament, and that lack of lament has led to a failure to learn and help others understand what is being so clearly demonstrated to them in this moment about the broken world that they live in. Friends, we have been given one of the greatest evangelistic opportunities seen in generations There has been an awakening. The world is on its knees in lament. And if we waste this moment to help them process that pain and use it to drive them closer to God, if we let it pass us while we idly waste our words on pointless arguments, we deserve the same fate as promised to the Ephesian church in Revelation chapter 2, having our lampstand removed until we repent. 
So sorry, a little bit bitey there. But a frustration I've had as, as a shepherd in a way that I've tried to minister to my other believers, pointing them to what needs to be done during this time. We have a world in lament, and we are to be the Jeremiah's of this world going, hey, we need to wake up and see what this sickness, this death, this pain is teaching, about, teaching us about who we are, what our world is really like, and who God is. The promise he has given to rescue us from moments like this through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. How we need to understand that this all comes because we are living in rebellion to God. This is a, a, a consequence. This is a reality of the sin that consumes us and captivates us. And the only one to rescue us from our sin, the only one to bring us out of the captivity that our rebellion brought us into is our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, friends... As we go throughout the process of lament, not just as a person, but as a nation and as a world, we as gospel people have the responsibility to do what Jeremiah, being led by God, is doing with the nation of Israel, helping them process their pain, helping it uh, allow them to waken their soul and their mind to see what they truly need, a redeemer, not to just rescue them from covid but from sickness and death and sin and eternity separated from the God, the one who created them. Now, today you might have the role to fulfill in the life of another, being their Jeremiah. Someone who you might know who's really struggling with fear of death and sickness. And it's been brought on by the events of the past four to six months. Friends, take the time to help them process biblically and learn from the pain, the grief, and the sorrow that surrounds them. But maybe you're Israel here today. Maybe you're suffering in some capacity, and maybe it's just because you live in a broken world. Will you let God shape and transform your heart through your pain? You know, sometimes I think we look at our grief and sorrow and say, God, just take it away. You know, I I don't want it. I don't need it. As quickly as you can get rid of it, make it gone. But maybe the prayer that needs to begin consuming our heart is, Lord, if I must go through this, transform me by it. Lead me closer to, a deep, closer to you through it, to a deeper understanding of you, a deeper obedience to you, a deeper faith in you. And this is what God's promised to do. Yes, I will use your suffering Romans chapter 5, James chapter 1, to refine you. But what we have to have then in the midst of our grief, in our sorrow is a teachable spirit, a heart that is opening and listening to what God would have to teach us through his sovereign control over our pain. Where am I at in time? I got a little bit more time here. And so uh, one brief moment where God did this in my own life uh, through a moment of pain and sorrow. You know, we, we enjoy connecting with our neighbors as best as we can. And there was a couple When we first moved in, who we quickly got connected with and uh, didn't know terribly well, but our relationship, you know, grew and uh, and it was very, um, it was very, very neat. The opportunities, Randy and Marsha, they live right next to us, and and I remember one day I'd come home from work. I can't even remember what day it was, but something very odd happened. The squad pulled up to Randy and Marsha's house, Uh, and. We've seen the squad pull up to a number of different people's houses in our neighborhood. We know what's up and why they're there. But that was a surprise because Randy and Marsha, as far as we knew, were healthy people. And I watched them roll Randy uh, out of the house into the back of the ambulance. We ran over, immediately asked Marsha what was up. And she said, I don't know. But later that evening, Marsha came home by herself. And the following morning, we went over and we learned that Randy died that evening. Massive heart attack, completely unexpected. And his life was gone. And as I stood there, it, it kind of hit me in a way that I didn't expect it to. It said, in all the years you stood next to this man, and all the years that you, uh, and all the years that you had living next to them, did you make the most of it for the gospel? This man's gone. Your opportunities are gone with it. As it says in Ephesians, did you make the most of your time living wisely for the sake of the gospel in this man's life? And that. Uh, the passing of Randy. And we went to the, to the funeral and we stood next to Marsha and we, we still have a good relationship with Marsha and continue to minister to her, but it kind of re-centered me. It reoriented my values and said, 
how do I need to make the most of every moment with the other neighbors who I do have left, who haven't been taken away by death? In that moment, the passing of Randy and the pain that it caused, and my heart broke especially for Marsha, knowing that what she was going through was so much deeper in its difficulty. But it challenged me. It reminded me to focus, to let my eternal values define my present moments. And maybe this is you here today, and that's just my personal example there, but where is it that pain needs to teach, shape, and redefine your values and, shape, and transform your heart. Well, let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer today. Father God, we want to thank you that by your grace, you have not allowed our suffering to be without point. And even as we look at this world and we see the effects of a pandemic, we see the panic, the fear, the worry... Lord, we know you're in control of all of it. And as we don't fully understand your purposes and how you're working in this moment, we know that you promised us that you are controlling all things to fulfill the purposes of your redemptive plan. Father, may we be like Jeremiah in this moment. May we be out drawing people to see the truth of pain, what it teaches us about our world and about the need of our Redeemer. May we not waste our time on pointless arguments that have nothing to do in the context of eternity. But may we focus on the souls that need to be saved. May we allow this moment, the startling moment that has come into our world, be an opportunity to point others to the truth of this world and the truth of their Savior. Father, I pray that in our own sufferings, you would help us have a humble spirit. So often, we look at the pain you bring into our life, and just as we talked about at the beginning, we recoil from it. We push it away like it's good for nothing. Lord, in our pain, may we embrace a teachable spirit that we might not come away from it just simply strengthened and sustained, but transformed by your grace. Father, we love you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.